Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're just going to give a couple more minutes for people to come through the waiting room and join. So just hang out. You can decide if you want your, um, sorry, you can decide if you want your name on your screen or not. You can edit just like in a normal um, Zoom meeting. And otherwise, we'll just give it a couple of minutes and um, get started. Okay, thanks for joining us, everyone. My name is Tina Stutz. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the Dissemination and Implementation Science Graduate Certificate Program here at the University of Colorado. Um, in this webinar, we're aiming to provide you some information about the certificate that might help you decide if you are interested in applying. We're gonna do a presentation first and it will be followed by time for questions and answers at the end of the session. Um, if you don't mind, we'd like you to remain on mute during the presentation. You can use chat to pose questions as we go, or you can wait until the end and you can unmute yourself at the end and ask questions. You can just enter them in chat. We'll be monitoring them as we go. Um, just to reduce background noise, we would appreciate it if everybody stays on mute until um, you might be asking a question um, later on. I'll also let you know the session is being recorded because we'll be posting it on our website. So, um, Jordan, can you switch slides? Thank you so much. So, um, the DNI Science Graduate Certificate Program is housed at Accords. Accords stands for the Adult and Child Center for Outcomes Research and Delivery Science here at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. It's a multidisciplinary center here that supports research across campus, um, different departments, different schools and colleges, and even outside of the university, with an emphasis on um, methods and content that are relevant to outcomes and community engaged translational research. So we also collaborate with the clinical sciences graduate program, which is part of our CCTSI, which is one of the clinical and translational science awards um, across the country. And we also collaborate with the University of Colorado um, Anschutz Medical Campus Graduate School. So the clinical science graduate program serves as our academic home for the certificate program. And the courses that are completed in it are um, approved by the graduate school offered through the graduate school. So this slide gives you a quick look at um, the people who are uh, involved in administering the program. So me, Borshika Rabin, Amy Hubschman, Jordan Crawford, who is our program coordinator, and then on the clinical sciences graduate program side, Lisa Chikudo and Galit Mankin. So if you end up um, applying for the program or beginning the program at some point, uh, at least five of these people, so the four uh, the three co-directors and Jordan and Galit are people that you would have a lot of contact with uh, during the program. And I'm also going to give you a quick introduction to our DNI certificate faculty. Jordan, if you could switch slides for me. Um, we have multidisciplinary faculty. They come from the Accords DNI Science Program um, here at the University of Colorado, but we also have um, instructors who come from institutions across the country, including um, UC San Diego, Wash U in St. Louis, UCLA. Loyola. Um, we have a lot of connections with the NIH Implementation Science Centers for Cancer Prevention and Control and the VA Query Program, as well as the National CTSA DNI um, Click Network. So you can see on here, um, uh, Russ Glasgow, he's the director of our DNI Science Program at, um, at Accords at the University of Colorado. He's an instructor and part of our faculty, Jody Haltrop, Bethany Kwan, Monica Perez Hoyes, who is uh, new to University of Colorado and will be teaching for us soon. Ross Brownson at WashU, um, Allison Hamilton, who many of you may know from her mixed methods work, who's at UCLA, UCLA and the VA, um, and then Meredith Fort and Katie Trinkley are both here, and Elaine Morado, who used to be here and now is um, dean at Loyola. So we have 
a really great faculty. One of the things that um, is important about our program is that not only do these instructors teach our courses, but we also invite leaders in the field frequently to come to our um, class sessions and guest lecture on specific topics, do really informal discussions with students to help them learn about um, different DNI topics. Jordan, if you could switch slides for me. This just gives you a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, we will do a quick uh, overview of what is DNI science for people who are very new to the area and interested in it. Um, Borshika Rabin is going to lead that part of our discussion. We will also talk about who might consider pursuing the DNI science certificate, why you might want to do so, where and how our certificate courses are held, and then we'll give you some information about um, tuition, how to apply, and when to apply to the program. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Rabin, who can introduce herself real quick as well. And um, we'll start with some quick definitions of DNI research. Thank you so much, Tina. My name is Borshika Rabin and uh, welcome to everyone who was able to join us today or are listening through the recording. I am an implementation scientist affiliated with the Colorado Group as well as UCSD. And uh, I have been the co-director for this program since its inception. Very excited to have you here today. And as Tina said, I'm going to keep this very brief because most of you most likely are knowledgeable about dissemination and implementation science to some degree. But we wanted to provide a few definitions and then just kind of place the certificate within the context of implementation science. So to start with uh, dissemination and implementation science, there are definitions, very formal definitions provided for this field. Dissemination and implementation research do not exist without each other, but they are distinct areas in some ways. Uh, dissemination research is primarily focused on packaging uh, evidence-based interventions and identifying channels that will work well to communicate these interventions to our target audiences or beneficiaries. Implementation research is more concerned with the receiving side the sites or the community settings where we are adopting and uh, implementing the interventions. And it is concerned about studying how we can support that uptake, implementation, and sustained use. Next slide, please. When we think about why dissemination and implementation science came about, very often we present this leaky pipeline, which you can see on the left side of the screen which reminds us of the really inefficient way that we are doing research. There are some numbers that we like to cite. They are not necessarily precise, but they are definitely shocking. We know that it takes about 17 years to get 14% of research evidence into practice. And when we all think about all the efforts that we take to create that research evidence, we want to be much more efficient than that. So this 14% uh, and 17 years is usually the starting point. But then there are some studies, and unfortunately not too many, that looked at how is it different when you use active dissemination and implementation science approaches. And some studies, again, in a limited number of studies, have shown that it can really change, dramatically change, suggesting that we can achieve up to 80% of adoption and implementation of research evidence and decrease the 17 years to three years. So again, these are um, important changes as uh, we think about the role of dissemination and implementation science. Next slide, please. When we reflect on the role of dissemination and implementation science in this T1, T4 continuum, which many of you will be very familiar with the traditional translational continuum, most commonly dissemination and implementation science is mentioned in this T3, T4 area, so the right side of the spectrum. However, we like to think that that's not the only role that DNI science can play. We believe that there are opportunities to design for dissemination, implementation, sustainment, if we incorporate some of the principles and methods of DNI science in earlier T stages, as early as T1 or T2 potentially. So as we think about our certificate program, while most people are doing work in the T3, T4 area, we do interact with researchers and practitioners who are in this T1, T2 area as well. And we feel that we can really think about ways that we can improve those areas to build for scalability. Next slide, please. 
So the dissemination and implementation graduate certificate came about to address uh, local and national needs for rigorous training in DNI science, in health services and public health research. We know that there are some national trainings and that there are increasing number of programs in specific institutes, but when the program started, there were less of them. And we also knew that they don't meet all the capacity that is needed. Only few people can get into these programs. So there was certainly space for another program. We are, of course, passionate about DNI science. We are lucky to have a really beautiful group of individuals locally at, in Colorado doing dissemination and implementation science that is nationally and internationally recognized. And we are connected with others, as Tina mentioned, who are coming from other institutions who were willing to come in and enrich our program further. Next slide, please. So when we first started to think about the program, we wanted to think of an educational philosophy that would address the unique needs that DNI science learners usually have. And things that came up to us were that we don't want students to do busy work. We know that most of you who are interested in this program are doing research or practice work already. You have uh, graduate uh, degrees. And so we are trying to tailor our materials and the assignments to the students' current DNI experience, professional background, and goal. And this is achieved by creating assignments that can be tailored to your specific work that you are doing, and then the content, often the examples that we bring in can be tailored. The reason why we can do this is because we are trying to keep the program tight. The class sizes are generally between 10 and 15 people maximum with very few exceptions when we go up to 16 or 17. And they are allowing for personal attention, personal feedback on assignments as well. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, we are not uh, big on busy work. We would like you to be able to apply what you learn immediately. So while we provide pretty rigorous theoretical background, we immediately put you in work and ask you to apply that to your own current uh, practice. And if you don't have something going on, we will help you find out um, what you could do. Next slide, please. We are also a competency-based program. We are using um, DNI Science published competencies to link to our courses. As we look at it, and there is a very nice um, um, matrix that we work with, each course is mapped on to this DNI certificate um, related competencies. And as you can see there, there, is a, there are a couple of publications listed. There is actually a new one that Amy Hipschman led that has some updated competencies. All of those are mapped onto our courses. So we make sure that we cover most or all of the DNI competencies that are currently identified for the field across the different uh, programs. And you can see a few examples here of the more kind of baseline uh, certificate competencies, developing a rational for why or how to select a DNI theory model or framework, designing pragmatic interventions, selecting process outcome measures, or using of mixed methods in specifically DNI studies. And then a big one for me that I love is adaptations and then fidelity. And finally, key stakeholders and uh, partners who we engage in the process and how to do that well. Next slide, please. We um, created a program that requires 12 credit hours to complete. And um, within a two to three year period, and Tina can speak to this a little bit more later, um, usually, you know, students, um, depending on their availability, would complete the program between two and three years. There are required courses, and those take up eight credit hours. And you can see there is the Introduction to Dissemination and Implementation Research in Health, which we offer in the fall. Then we have a Designs and Mixed Methods in Implementation Research, which is offered currently in the spring semester. And then the designing for dissemination and sustainability course, which um, is uh, in the fall. Uh, so it's going to start to be in the fall in 2023. And then the next slide, please. And then we have um, elective courses that you can choose from, including the context and adaptation and implementation research, a grant writing for dissemination and implementation research, advanced topics in dissemination and implementation science, and then other electives that we can approve 
and you will have to have the certificate director approve those. You can see the timing when these are offered, and then, of course, the instructors. And in a moment here, we are going to start to go through each course very briefly to give you a sense what they cover. We can go to the next slide, please. So I will start with the introduction and then I will hand it back to Tina um, to continue on some other course content. The introduction to dissemination and implementation research in health has been around for many, many years, even uh, predating the certificate. Uh, currently it's co-taught by Tina and myself, and we are really the starting point, the springboard for your certificate program. Um, we are covering key dissemination and implementation models, theories, and frameworks. We talk about methods and measures. We also invite uh, a number of um, guest lecturers, nationally known guest lecturers, to share about their experience, about DNI strategies, engagement of partners. We talk about um, quality improvement and also the implementation, sustainment. So we try to touch on a number of strategies and uh, competencies, but not in great depth. We do have you apply these. The core function of the course is really get you comfortable with your DNI theories and models and apply those. And then we will hand you off to the next course where you will get more in depth on the methods and measures. With that, I will hand this over to Tina. Thank you so much, Borshika. So um, we just wrapped up at last semester our latest iteration of that intro class. And um, it's always uh, it's an amazing class. It's really fun. And like Borshika said, we try to span the whole spectrum of what DNI is all about, but help you also think through specifically how you're going to incorporate that into your own work, your own practice, your own research. Um, the next class that she mentioned that we hand you off to after the intro class is the Designs and Mixed Methods and Implementation Research course. Um, this one will be taught, it's it's being taught this semester by um, Jody Haltrop and Meredith Fort. They co-teach together. Um, and this course generally covers commonly used research designs and implementation research um, with a lot of emphasis on mixed methods and integration. So there's a um, some of the topics in this class include how to conduct implementation studies in real world settings, pragmatic approaches, quantitative and qualitative methods of assessment or data collection, and then most importantly, how to integrate those methods and interpret results. So if you're familiar with DNI science, mixed methods are crucial. It's, it's really rare these days that we see much implementation research happening without a combination of qualitative and quantitative approaches, but often um, for clinician scientists or for other researchers, sometimes we have more of a training in one of those areas than the other or haven't had um, extensive training on mixed methods. Even if you have had extensive training in mixed methods and use them, this course really focuses on how to use them for implementation research specifically. And one of the um, activities in this course that kind of spans the whole semester is working on a DNI methods section for a research proposal. So really working on your approach. In the intro class, we think a lot about specific aims and kind of get you started. In this course, you really work a lot on what you would actually do and how, we, how you would use these methods. Next slide, please. The next class um, is Designing for Dissemination and Sustainability. So this one is um, currently caught, taught by Dr. Bethany Kwan, who will have a co-instructor with her as well. This is offered in the fall semesters. Um, in this course, you're really learning about a design thinking process, co-design, thinking about context, planning from the very beginning about how your program or intervention or guidelines are actually going to be usable in the long term. So we think about dissemination, implementation, sustainability, and equity right from the beginning. So lots of the um, information in this class covers how to identify partners and potential adopters and influencers who are relevant to your research and helping you integrate those perspectives and needs and preferences right from the very beginning with the goal that you're not going to end up developing something that will just sit on a shelf and never be used, which might have something to do with the 17-year gap that we've seen <laughs> without DNI science. Next slide, please. Um, the next course, Borshika already mentioned, um, she and I co-teach this course as well. This is Context and Adaptation in DNI Research. This is an elective course. It's a two-credit hour class. Um, 
offered in the spring semesters. And in this class, we really narrow the focus from all DNI theories, models, and frameworks to think mostly about determinants, frameworks, and contextual models. And so in this class, we think about that balance between um, adaptations and fidelity, the importance of um, assessing dynamic context and figuring out what you need to do to make your intervention or program work in a changing context, um, understanding multi-level assessment of context and changes in context over time and iterative approaches. And also um, in, in most, in every class, actually, we address the important role of DNI science in advancing health equity. So when you think about adaptations in context, the health equity topic is really important in this class. Next slide, please. Um, the grant writing course, uh, I'm gonna uh, quickly give you a summary of this. I was lucky enough to co-teach this with um, Drs. Glasgow and Brownson a couple of summers ago. This is a great class for people who are actually preparing a K application, their R01 application, whatever it might be. Um, it's also an elective, it's offered in the summer, so it's on a slightly shorter time frame. Um, and the goal here is that you are going to intensively focus on sections of your DNI grant applications and um, grant writing strategies for DNI reviewers in particular are emphasized. You draft and revise sections of a grant application, receive a lot of feedback, and then it culminates in a mock study section um, as the final assignment. It's not really a final exam, it's your final assignment. You also have the opportunity to review others application. So you get the experience of being both the um, applicant and the reviewer. And um, this is a really pretty, I feel like, exceptional opportunity because you are learning from exceptionally well-funded DNI researchers who have also had leadership roles at NIH, um, who have led the DNI study section that used to be DIRH and is now SIHH. So this is a great elective class for people who are interested in grant writing. Um, this course is also just a two credit hour course offered in the summers. And I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Hubschman for the next slide um, so she can talk about her advanced research topics course. Thank you very much, Tina. And I, I want to also just point to the, the chat comments that are going and encourage you to put comments in the chat. I'm going to ask Jordan to put our DNI um, certificate website in the chat also so people may scroll around there as we go um, if that's helpful to you. So I'm going to pick up where Tina left off and talk about the course that I co-teach, uh, Advanced Research Topics in DNI Science. This is an elective course um, and it really dovetails on our DNI team meeting that we have at University of Colorado in Accords and includes journal club discussions. So there's the students participating, but then there's a larger group of additional DNI scientists um, across the university with different levels of expertise. So it really gives a really nice sounding board um, of other voices in addition to the students in addition to our two teachers. Um, and then students also benefit from delivering an, a research presentation on what they're doing. Uh, to a small group of our faculty. Next slide, please, Jordan. Um, so we have a wide array of backgrounds, disciplines for our students. We are content agnostic, as many uh, DNI science trainings are, because we know that it's uh, important to get evidence into practice across many different discipline and content areas. Um, we include PhDs, MDs, other professional disciplines um, in the students who enroll. And you can see on here a couple of quotes from two of our students, one from the University of Colorado, one um, from Northwell Health, um, showing again the geographic spread. We also have student, a student from Canada, so we are now international in the scope of our training. Next slide. These are two additional quotes from other students. Again, um, one outside the University of Colorado, one uh, inside the University of Colorado, um, highlighting the benefits of participating in our online certificate because um, they can you can do this from anywhere. We had developed this in this way also prior to the uh, pandemic and switch, shift to Zoom. So we were uh, well prepared for this and already intended to do this to have a broad scope to multiple types of students. Next slide, please. So who should pursue the certificate? Um, as we said, it's not um, specific to a content area, but um, Borschka showed the phases of translational research. And it is squarely in the health outcomes research 
um, sphere where we're looking at T3 and T4 segments of translational research, trying to take evidence into practice. Um, at times, trying to also define the evidence in a type one hybrid effectiveness trial, for example, with um, important engagement of invested partners. The types of professional uh, training is listed there, health services, people working in health systems, people working in communities, people working in public health are all appropriate. Next slide. Different career stages, you know, as we put this certificate together, we really thought hard uh, and it's proven over the last um, four years since we've been going at this, that uh, it's relevant really for these different types of career stages. We've had people join the certificate, graduate from the certificate in each of these niches. Um, people doing K awards, um, it's very natural fit there in particular because there's uh, obviously a set of training that those doing a K award want to accomplish. So this fits very nicely there when the goal, one of the goals of training of a K award is implementation science focused. We've had mid-career faculty um, who want to become a local expert for DNI research methods in their institution. Have had examples of people doing that, and some in that in that space have sought to be part of a learning health system at their institution. So that's one uh, particular way that's panned out. Those actually doing their graduate training, people who are students in a PhD or doctor PhD program. Um, especially on our campus where there's a nice synergy between our clinical sciences program and our School of Public Health, have used this as an area of a minor concentration of research methods for implementation science. And then we've had uh, at least one other student go on to um, start a PhD program after exploring this as an area that they wanted to pursue within the PhD, a way to test it out. Next slide, please. Where the course is held, we already mentioned this is an online uh, program. So our courses are fully available online. We do typically use the Zoom video conference platform. Um, and thus our students are across the US and Canada in their location. We do have synchronous classes though. So although they're online, there is active participation of students and faculty at the same time. This is not something you just dial up and do on your own, um, thus you, Students do need to be able to plan uh, to block out time during their workday um, to attend these courses. Our academic home, uh, Tina nicely described earlier, um, and we can apply courses to graduate degrees here at the University of Colorado uh, most easily. Next slide. In terms of how to apply, um, Jordan, uh, I believe you've put the, yes, Jordan, uh, if you scroll up just a little at 23 minutes past the hour by my look in the chat, um, has the website clicked. So you can click on there if you want to also be able to look at certain areas on the website. But we have an admissions tab um, that I'm showing a view of here. And basically you can click in here, see the 2023 application cycle, click on the um, elements of the document there, the admission requirements, the required application documents, and there are also specific criteria for any international applicants. Next slide. These are the requirements at a minimum. Um, we do have a competitive application cycle though each year and have more students apply than we are able to take. So. Um, Having even more than what is listed as the bare minimum for these admission requirements is beneficial. Next slide. The, this is the list of the required application documents. We try to keep this fairly streamlined and simple. Um, and it does help us to understand you know, how this is fitting with your trajectory and how our implementation science certificate could advance your career, which is certainly our goal. Um, so we want to understand the interest, your motivation, what you hope to gain professionally from the program. We have you submit a CV or a resume, um, ideally the CV, the, the transcripts from your highest completed degree. And MD applicants do need to include an undergraduate degree transcript. We mentioned that just to make sure you take the extra time to go ahead and get that information. That's because many medical schools don't include the grades required for a um, grade point average calculation. Um, a statement of how the program will fit into current responsibilities, and we would um, also note there's an optional letter of support, but that letter of support um, from a um, your division chair or whoever would be appropriate a mentor to specify if there will be um, 
ability to carve out time for you to attend these. As we mentioned, there are synchronous times that you need to attend um, courses. It's helpful to know that that will be um, available for you if you're accepted into the program. And then there's a, a application fee of $50 for domestic applicants. Next slide. So we do have the um, specific university requirements also listed. Uh, we will provide these slides and post them on our website after this. Um, so you can click on these different links. Um, there's the special requirements for international applicants that are listed there and a slightly different application fee of $75 US for international applicants. Okay, next slide. This one um, is my last one before I pass back to Tina. So we do have the website that, that uh, Jordan has placed in the chat. It does allow you to click around for a deeper dive on the application admissions process. The direct link to the application we've also noted here in this slide. And again, this slide deck will be posted. Um, and to begin a new application, this gives the cascade of things to do, what to click on when you go to this um, uh, link for the graduate school. Our cycle of open applications is from January 15th to February 15th. So the day after Valentine's Day is the last day to let us know if you're um, applying for this next season. Otherwise, we will be open again next year, have a, another open application cycle at this time. And if you have technical questions about the application forms, we'll uh, point you to Gleet Mankin, who's our um, contact for those types of questions. Uh, the types of questions we're answering, I think, are the ones going in the chat that I haven't been able to process on quickly, uh, but I know Borsch and Tina are tracking while I'm presenting, uh, and we certainly want to help answer, is this certificate right for me? Should I really be applying for this? On to the next slide and back to Tina. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and I will I will chime in on this one piece of information about the application um, process itself is that uh, recently the graduate school here at Colorado sp sort of split for the medical campus and then the Denver campus. And so if you some people I know here have applied before or who have looked into applying before and the graduate school structure has changed slightly. So um, Galit is an important contact for you to have. Her information is also on the website. So if you are struggling to find the right application form, there is only one, whether you're a current student, outside CU, inside CU, there's one application form that everybody fills out um, and finding it uh, if you're having trouble finding it, we've tried to be really clear with the instructions, but please do let us know. We will help you. Um, and it won't appear. So if you go onto the application website right now, you won't see it because it doesn't actually come up until the January 15th date that it opens. So don't panic if you get off this call and decide to start your application early, it won't actually um, appear. <laughs> So just want to let you know that um, this slide that Jordan has put up is about tuition costs, which is a really frequent question for people who are interested in the program. Um, there is a link from our website to the graduate school tuition costs. And what you are going to look for is the MS Clinical Sciences Program. That is the um, CLSC program that we are under the Clinical Sciences Program, and we have the same tuition costs that they do. So um, the current year, this is not for next fall, but the current year costs are um, $541 US dollars per credit hour for a Colorado resident and 1,315 for non-residents. Um, and this is likely to slightly change for the fall, but they haven't posted the new information yet. However, the link um, on our website takes you to the most updated information. So as soon as the university updates that, that's what you'll see when you hit the link. Um, a reminder that it is 12 credit hours total to complete the certificate. So it's eight required um, credit hours between three courses that are three credits, three credits, and two credits. And then the remaining four elective hours um, are, are uh, the classes that you can kind of choose from our electives or get permission to take um, a specific course. Like, for example, we have a system science course that um, Dr. Fort is teaching in public health, and you're you're able to take that as an elective if you want to. So there's there's some flexibility with electives. If you're a University of Colorado faculty member, um, then you may be able to use tuition assistance for courses if you're eligible. So that's something that you would just need to check on. 
Next slide, please, Jordan. So um, this meeting is most relevant for our fall 2023 certificate cohort. We're really excited that there's so much interest in the program. Um, so as Amy mentioned, the application will become available on January 15th. Um, you can go to our website to see the instructions and to link directly to where you need to start your application. Um, the final date that we're accepting them is on February 15th. There's more information on the website and the application section about um, you know, we accept unofficial transcripts from domestic universities. If it's international, there are additional requirements. So all that kind of information is available. You can look into it more for your unique situation. Um, we anticipate completing review of the applications by late March, maybe early April. Um, and then we start notifying applicants by email of their status. So um, you will hear from us uh, by April, if if you've applied to the program, um, the courses be begin in late August 2023. So on the university website, there's an academic calendar, and you um, we follow the graduate school um, calendar. Next slide. Um, this is our acknowledgement slide. And so even though it's Jordan, me, Borshika, and Amy on the uh, webinar today, there are so many people who make this program possible. Um, I want to call out our DNI certificate faculty who are just really dedicated to um, developing capacity and training people at all levels in DNI science um, methods and approaches and principles and how to how to really start applying DNI in your own work. So our faculty are amazing and we're really grateful to them um, for making time in their schedules to actually be a part of this program. Um, and Accords, we want to acknowledge our director and administration who have been very supportive of the program the whole time. Jordan, who is multitasking furiously during this entire webinar, is fantastic and has been with us now for, I think, a little over a year and he's wonderful. And then, of course, CCTSI and the graduate school at um, CU. So we're going to pause for one second on the next two slides just so that you can see them and again we've said this multiple times but these will be posted and the video will as well if you have programs like academic questions about the program you can contact me at this email address if you have questions about the application process or graduate school requirements galit is the right contact for those and the next slide just uh, reminds you for probably the 30th time within the webinar of our uh, certificate website, which is pretty easy to find if you just put in DNI certificate Colorado. I think that one word will like take you right there. And then I'm going to turn it over to Borshika, who is going to help facilitate the Q&A. We've been tracking what you have in the chat, but if you haven't entered something in the chat and have a question, um, I don't know if the hand raising feature will work. Uh, maybe put it in the chat and then we'll make sure that it's on our list. And I'll turn it over to Borshika right now. Thank you so much, Tina and Amy. Um, so now it's all up for you to ask your questions. We already received a few, so I will start with those. You are also welcome, I think, to unmute yourself. Just be aware that we are recording these, this session because we want to make sure that those who couldn't make it is, are able to. Um, hear from us. So if you are going to unmute and talk to us, then that will be recorded and posted. So let me actually check whether there is any immediate question from people who are willing to unmute. And then I can tap into the previous questions. If anyone would like to unmute or ask a question. If not, then let me start by looking at some of the questions you already posed, and then please do add them to the chat if you have new ones. So the first question we tracked was, um, how many credits are electives? I'm hoping to start a PhD program at another university. Is it possible to transfer in relevant coursework for electives, or do all credits need to be at CU? And I think Tina will help us with that question. So that's a very good question. Um, okay, so it's 12 credits overall. Eight credits are required courses in the certificate program. Four credits, which is either um, two or three courses, depending on which ones you choose, um, are electives. Because this is a 
Color University of Colorado Graduate School Certificate Program, um, they will require the 12 credits be completed at University of Colorado. If you have taken a course at a different university that is equivalent to a course that we offer here, we can review that and likely give administrative approval to not have to take that course here, but you would still need the 12 credit hours. So you would end up, for example, if you took an equivalent required course at a different university, we could approve the content, but you would likely need to take another elective then. So the 12 credit hours is like kind of the definition of um, the course load that you need to complete for the certificate. So there can be a little bit of flexibility there. Um, I think the most common thing people ask us is if they've done TITER or TITER or some sort of intro level DNI training, can that count as the intro class? We typically don't let that count as the intro class because if you look at for if you looked at the syllabus for the intro class, it's much more in depth than what um, any type of uh, training program like that can provide. Those are awesome. Many of us have done those training programs too, and they're really wonderful, but they're not exactly equivalent to a graduate level class in intro to DNI. So there, you know, I think if you have a, a specific situation, you should contact uh, me and you can ask about that. We often like discuss it among the three of us because we've had lots of students come through the program. Um, and then we work with the graduate school on requirements to make sure that uh, you're meeting them before you're you're completing the certificate. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, let me go to the next one then. I have heard about a co-equal emphasis with the program on methods and practice. I have also heard that there may be tracks evolving for those in the program according to these interests. What would those tracks mean for aspiring DNI scientists versus practitioners as far as their exposure to various faculty, program peers and coursework. I think we said, Tina, you might start it and I'm happy to jump into add on if I feel that there do, is anything. Okay, do you wanna start or do you want me I to can, start? I can, well, I will say that this is, thank you so much for this question. Um, as you might imagine in a DNI certificate, we are constantly thinking about improving iteratively. And one of the things that we noticed is that we have slightly different interest needs for those who are coming from more of an implementor a practitioner background than those who are primarily NIH or other types of research funder focused researchers. So we have been talking a lot about how to address these differences in needs and interests. And I would say that so far, the way that we addressed it is within each course, working with the student to help them create assignments that are relevant to them. Most of the assignments uh, admittedly are still more of the traditional research kind of assignments, but we were able to work with individuals if they wanted to work on a QI proposal that would be more relevant to their practice work, if um, they needed additional support because they have not written proposals before or they have less of the research training. And we found that perhaps the first course will be a little bit rockier just because they need just a little bit more extra, but we work with them. And usually by the second course, these students are as good or above the research uh, focused ones, and they bring in that unique perspective. Moving forward into the future, we have talked about how we could accommodate these differences more uh, prominently. And so we talked about these tracks that you mentioned. Uh, we have not fully figured them out, but I think that the way they will come to happen are through um, differentiation in uh, uh, the electives, and then again, these will be still the same students. I don't think we will separate students out because we feel that there is a lot to be learned uh, bidirectionally between these two types of learners. But we are going to continue to develop a stronger emphasis on supporting both tracks more prominently. So let's see if Tina and Amy had others because we, this is a discussion we have had over the past. We talk months. about it a lot. It's I think the reason we talk about it so much is that it's amazing to have researchers and practitioners together in the same courses. So we really don't want to split this split the groups up, you know. And um, I think that because it's offered at an academic university, we tend to get a lot of researchers who apply to the program. But we are really lucky that we also get people who are embedded in health systems, you know, and want to really get great training in DNI. So um, 
we have noticed kind of what Borsiga just said, for example, the grant writing class, that's, that's an elective. It's very oriented toward writing a research grant, you know, whether that's an NIH grant or CDC or a foundation, um, it, it's very research oriented. And so if you are never going to write a grant <laughs> because you're, you know, your everything you do is kind of covered by where you work, you might not want to take that class, but we have other electives that you can take. So as we think through this potential development of grants, it's sort of a a thought process of what skills are really essential for each role and what we can make uh, flexible or optional um, while still getting the same quality of training and the same amount of training we may be able in the future to kind of tweak what's required or how we steer students into the electives. Amy, did you have any additional ones or should we move to the next? I think we should move to the next given the no. wealth of questions. You well, let me then um, ask from you, actually, Amy, uh, a question. Is this program appropriate for those pursuing a master's degree who have no PhD or MD yet? I think this is partly related to Tina's question. Of course, every, every student may be different. This might be good to email with Tina about so we know more about your circumstances, how close you are to being complete with the, your master's course of work. Um, where you're at exactly. It, it, given this is a competitive program, it may be difficult to be competitive with some of the more advanced um, degree um, applicants. Please and uh, Amy, send I us a keep question. You on the, keep, you, keep you on the um, spot, um, again, um, related to time zones when classes are offered, and then related to that, uh, what are the time frames when these classes happen? Yeah, thank you. This is important. I, I will say that we try to keep, we're recognize, we recognize that we span time zones for our students and those attending currently um, range from the Pacific time zone to the Eastern time zone of the United States. So we try to be cognizant of that. Um, current courses, most are taught between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. mountain time. So the, but that would be for the west western part of the United States, Pacific, no earlier than 8 a.m. The eastern time zone, some of those do get into then the 6 p.m., 7 p.m., the after 5 p.m. time. The majority of courses are more midday so that they would stay between that uh, time zone and including the intro course, which would be the first one you know, that we sort of need to be addressed sooner rather than later is midday. But it's a good point for us to try to specify that further on our website. So we'll look to, to do that in the near term. Uh, the date of the week varies across the courses also. It's not always Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. Super. And then Tina mentioned that we the courses meet once per week. There are no courses yes. that have multiple meeting times. But again, as Tina said, these are synchronous learning courses, except for the independent study options where you would be able to work with your instructor. The, the other question that we had, and I will try to tackle this first, is how many credits do students usually take in a year? And so what we see, and, and um, Amy and Tina, please jump in, that we students usually take one course per semester. And we are on a semester basis in Colorado. I know that UCSD is on quarter. We are a semester. So we go from August through December, and then again, January through, I think, May. And uh, what happens is um, students usually only do one course per semester. There would be a rare occasion when someone would also do an independent study just to, to finish up. Uh, we have seen that, but I would say that one per semester. And of course, how many credit that means, it depends on which course you are taking. The main courses, two of them, the core courses are three credit hours. And then the third one is two credit hour. So when you take those, that's some combination of those, Usually students take first the intro, then the methods, and then go into the uh, two credit uh, core course of designing and then electives. But we have seen other variations depending on their availability or amount that they can take. So that adds up to you know either you are taking in a year six or you are taking five or it's possible that you would be taking four credit hours. Let's see what else. The next one is um, costs associated with the program beyond the um, what we have already shared for credit hours. So Tina, would you mind to speak to that? So there's the application fee. Um, tuition is the bulk of the cost of the program. 
I think, uh, and this is something to look up on the graduate school website, um, there is likely some sort of online course fee that is, I feel like it's around $100 per course that the university charges <laughs> for that. And this is in the same place on our website, you can link to tuition and fees, you can actually see the fees. And they list all of them in one big table, and only some of them are relevant to this program. Like many of them are specific to a, a particular school on campus or a specific, a specific program on campus. So there may be a small um, sort of online, and they I'm not sure if they charge an activity fee or not. Uh, lots of graduate schools do that across everyone, even though our students are, you know, never here. <laughs> well, some of them, are, I guess, are here, but we never meet on campus. And um, it's unlikely that somebody, you know, in New York is going to be using our wellness center, um, but they may be doing some sort of activity fee. And I would double check on that with the graduate school. If it's, if it's something that you're trying to build a very specific budget for, um, tuition costs typically do go up a tiny bit each, each year, like somewhere between 20 and $40 a credit hour is what I've seen over the last three years. So those estimates um, that we shared for this academic year will likely be a tiny, tiny bit higher next year, and then maybe a tiny bit higher the following year. So I would sort of round up a little bit when you're thinking about what tuition is going to look like if you're trying to create a budget for a K award, for example, or for your department or whoever is um, hoping to support you in, in taking the classes. Oh, and also textbooks. I was going to mention that. There are two textbooks that are typically required. One, um, we're waiting for a new edition of, oh, thank you, Amy, of like the, the DNI, the main DNI text. Um, a new edition is coming out, but I don't think we know exactly when. I think it's like coming. <laughs> so uh, it's got my author proof. So I think oh, yes. uh, it should be soon. A good sign. So um, we we require that text. And then there is for the designs and mixed methods class, I believe it's still required. There is um, a, a kind of uh, interactive developing your project uh, mixed methods book that we also use in the program. As far as I can remember, those are the only two required texts. And mostly we use articles, you know, and we share them via Canvas so that people can access them easily and freely. Super. Um, we have a couple of more questions I see. One was related to coordinating the certificate application with NIH application in January. And I don't know if Amy, you would take that. Yeah, happy to take that. So we certainly hear from many people who are saying, I'm applying for a K award. I want to write this in. How do I do that exactly? And so what we would suggest is as you as you will work with your mentor on you know what you're going to list for your training goals and specific courses for training goals you could list this uh, and the courses that are on our certificate website is what you would plan to take for um, that training goal uh, we recognize our program is competitive you do also uh, there are other certificate programs in the universe so you could also consider listing ours as an example but noting there are other certificates that if uh, that are another potential for you so not all your eggs in one basket um, with us per se, but it does let you show very concretely there are some courses and some specific competencies I would gain um, in this area. Thank you so much, Amy. And then the last one, uh, Amy will start that off and then Tina jump in, uh, related to the competitiveness of the application. And do we know um, concrete quantitative numbers or can we talk about it qualitatively of what percent of the students or what proportion of the students might get accepted from the applicant pool? And Amy, uh, would you like to start there? Absolutely. Um, and so this is a good uh, call to action for us to track what it's been over the last few years. So I'm answering off the top of my head. Um, it's It's been more than two thirds of applicants uh, over the time since our inception, but I would need to get more specific um, in each specific, each particular year. Uh, but the, the majority of applicants that we've been able to accept. It is the majority. I'm actually looking in our uh, <laughs> looking at our files. I'm so sorry for not being able to answer. I can tell you, I can tell you how many we usually accept. So um, we talked about this right at the beginning around the educational philosophy that we do try to keep our class sizes small enough that you're able to get really high quality feedback from the instructors and also from people in your class and that we have um, very interactive class sessions with a lot of discussion. And so to do that, we really do aim to keep our class sizes between 10 and 15. So that usually means that we accept something like 
12 to 14 students per cohort who are coming in. And um, because we are a University of Colorado program, um, half of those students are typically University of Colorado um, faculty or graduate students applying to the certificate. And then the other half are people applying from outside the university. And um, the numbers of applicants each year it's grown over, you know, we're, I think in our fourth year now, and it has grown each year. So it's hard for me to give you a percent. I would say that, um, I do agree. I think the majority are accepted. We also keep a waiting list. Um, so we, if, if we don't, initially accept you and we put you on a wait list, sometimes something happens with the people who've been accepted and they're not able to start or they defer or something happens. Um, and then we can add people into the program um, when that happens, like as long as it's before that cohort begins. It's not the greatest question. I would say the reason we mention it being competitive is because when you look at the application, there are these two open-ended questions. You know, they're they're short. They're like, what are you hoping to get out of this? Uh, like, why are you interested? And how is this going to affect your professional tra trajectory? We really want you to take these questions seriously because they don't look like a personal statement that you think of when you apply to a graduate program. They're short, you know, and they're kind of like online. You fill them in. Those are really, you know, in addition to your academic qualifications and your CV or your practice, your practitioner qualifications and what you're doing, those very brief answers are what we have to go on. So when we say it's competitive, um, we really want you to communicate to us like why you should be in this program in those two shorter answers. It helps us a lot to kind of um, sort through and make some decisions. For example, if you have a funded K and this is in it, let us know that, you know, that's important for us to know as we're looking at, um, at, at people's, uh, qualifications and interests and motivation to be in the program. Super. And I will add that we have made decisions about not accepting someone because we didn't feel they would be successful in the program. So that's kind of where this comes in as well, that we had situations where we felt that the student would struggle, not a good fit. And these answers help us decide about that. So um, I think that that is taking us to the end of the list of questions I had. Is there any last um, question from the audience? Is there anything that was not discussed and you really need to know? Of course, we are excited to help you individually. As we mentioned earlier, feel free to email Tina, Amy, or myself and we will get back to you. We are happy to also meet with you briefly if we feel that that's the most efficient way to connect. And uh, we will make this recording available on the website. And I will let Tina tell me, do you think it's going to be by the end of this week when it's going to be posted? I do. I think Jordan is actually hoping to get it up later today. Um, and Amy, I see your hand is raised. <laughs> oh, yes, One Amy. last thing, I had put it in the chat, but just want to say it verbally if people are listening to a recording, um, that the other part in those personal statements that's helpful and or with an optional letter of support is to be clear to us you have time and energy put aside to do this over the next two years um and in, in particular if there's a letter of support from someone who's saying yes i will release you to do these things that that helps us um a great deal to have confidence you have the capacity to do the training yeah all right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. We're really excited to see at least your names and for some of you, your faces. <laughs> and um, feel free to follow up with us after this. We will post the slides and the video. And we really hope to hear from um, as many of you as are interested in applying to the program and let us know if we can give you any more information. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.